This is one of my dream vintage watches, but it's broken. And in this video, I am going to attempt to fix it. Hello, my name is Mike and welcome to my workbench where all the action is going to take place in this video. Let me introduce you to the Bullover Accutron 214. These things are highly collectible and they're the first watches to have ever used a tuning fork as a timing regulator. They were introduced in 1960 and they were a revolution in timekeeping because they boasted an accuracy of two seconds a day, which is around about a minute a month. And this was all a decade before quartz that were even invented. When these watches are working, they give off an audible hum because the tuning fork is vibrating. And I think that's what gives them a lot of appeal along with the sweep second hand and also the accuracy. However, this watch is completely humless. And I am about to venture into the unknown because I have never worked on one of these movements before. Brave? Foolish? Well, I'll let you decide. Let's go to the bench and inspect the watch. And just before I remove the case back itself, let me draw your attention to a few things. So I've just removed um, this, which is the little spring thing that holds it all together. And uh, that was a job and a half. I had to get my big tool out. And uh, I'll show you a photo of that now. The amount of grime that came off uh, with it, rust or dirt, I don't know. DNA most likely was immense and rather gross at the same time. But we have this here. This is the crown. And the crown is broken, completely broken. They should have this little bit that lifts up here. And um, I've managed to sort a crown, a guy called Dave uh, Madison, I think his name was, in one of the Accutron groups, kindly contacted me and we did a deal and I bought a new crown and I also bought a movement holder for this, a proper 218 movement holder, 214 movement holder, sorry. Uh, so let me just bring in, I have one other 214, which is this gold version, which I've had to use also so that I can line up the hands to remove them. And you can see here, this just lifts up, see, um, I'm not going to do it with this piece of wood bollocks things, but it lifts up and you turn that and it turns the hands. So there we go. If you just want to have a quick look at the dial on this one, proper beautiful, uh, get it into focus, bit of patina on there and you can see that clear. That's the smoothest sweep second hand there is, as far as I'm concerned, absolutely beautiful. All right, case back off and you can see the layer of dirt that awaits me to clean as we go around the movement but you can see down here swiss made 214h h is for hacking this one does hack bulova uh, brevet patent and by the looks of things i would say a battery has possibly leaked here and uh, we'll just test it with a bit of wood and just see yeah look so that's going to clean up quite nicely all of the action happens under here. And just try and get that in focus as best I can. So we are looking at quite a lot of dirt. And that's possibly why it's not running. There will be an argument that it could be something to do with the index wheel, which is under here. Uh, but we'll get to that. So just inspection of the, the top plate here. Well, look, this is all just grime and dirt and rust that's going to be all throughout those wheels you've got these shock jewels here and i but they're very reminiscent of the seiko ones i'm quite proficient with those but i'm going to resist removing those at all costs because i don't know if i'll ever find replacements so it might be a real long cleaning bit to get those right and it's all going to have to come off as a result here are the the magnetic coils, so the magnets are underneath and the coils are outside and that's what causes them to vibrate. Uh, the, the, the coil racks obviously polar opposites and all of that uh, good stuff. So yeah, that's what it looks like there. If I just quickly turn it over, can we see much on the dial side? As you can see, I have lined up the hands uh, critical for removal. I would hazard a guess they're either not original hands or they are hands that have been relumed. And we can just see a little bit of the circuitry, but we're going to see more of that as we get on. Looks a bit 
corroded, I suppose, frosty, whatever, but it's working. And because it's working, I'm not really going to touch them other than get them out of there. And I've been told as well that this is not a genuine crystal because of the way the lettering is on that one. Um, I don't know enough about it, but I guess they're right. It's probably a bit not accurate enough, is it? It should be a bit sharper, perhaps, the edges to the lettering. But I don't care for the money I've paid. This is an ultimate bargain, and if I can get it going, I'm going to be the happiest man alive. And there we are, it is out of the case. First thing to come off is the hands. And the worry is with these is you're not supposed to move that second hand at all if you can help it, because it could damage the index finger. So I'm going to try and just lever them off like I would normally. And that was a complete success. And the Canon Pinion Remover Tool. So I have to take this spring off to get to the wheels here. This bottom screw looks like it's also holding part of the coil on. And look, there's a little thing to hold that on as well there, look, see? I am particularly nervous at the moment, I have to say. Working on a watch that I've wanted for five, six years maybe does bring a bit of trepidation. But read the manual quite a few times and uh, in fairness, they don't look too complicated. Right, so I think I've got to flip it over now and do something on the other side. So here we have the guard plate to protect the index and pawl fingers, which are much thinner than a human hair and both have jaws on the end. So I have to move, remove the guard first. So hopefully you can just make out the fingers there. And the, the wheel is just that little bit of gold bit there sticking out, which is the index wheel. An amazing thing, about 2.3 millimetres in diameter, over, well, I think it's 300 teeth, or 360 teeth uh, cut into that. Absolutely phenomenal bit of engineering. Um, so it has a guard, another guard, which is this thing, and we don't remove it. Apparently, you undo, undo the screw a little bit and move it out of the way. So it's now moved out of the way and I've just got to tighten that up uh, so it doesn't come back and bite me in the backside a little bit later. So this is the Paul Bridge and that controls that finger there, it touches the wheel. So I've got to back that off and it's operated by cam. This is a cam screw. So I need to just unscrew this a little bit to loosen it. And now I should be able to turn the cam
and I can't really see, but that should be moving the finger off of the wheel. Uh, so I need to get a line of sight on that. It's just to keep it safe, that's all. So I'm just blinded and hampered by all the cameras. So if you can see it moving, great. I think I can just see it there. Okay, so the movement I've just looked at on my stereoscope is really, really small, but it's enough. It is now free from that wheel. So I've just got to turn the movement over and take some more parts off. This is a really tiny, tiny screw. Look at that. Glad actually my tweezers are slightly magnetized. That's going to be interesting to refit. Right, I'm now back on the dial side. I had to put a screw back in the fork because I forgot to remove these two screws here to remove the chaton, and that will get the uh, center second pinion out. And there's the pinion. Right, now I can raise the fork and you have to be careful of the index finger that is attached to the fork. Now, excuse my fingers. So you can just see it there. And that allows me access to this uh, screw cover plate here. There's a whole array of different sizes, style screws on this this movement. Now I'm curious to know whether this one's ever been taken apart because so far the screws look pretty much untouched. Now it's time to try and get the coil and the uh, fork all out in one go. And I think they're going to be stuck. I'm so worried about that index finger. It looks like the coils are going to come out. Oh, that's not right either. Ah! I've watched an old video of the master himself, a guy called Henry, who was the technician, and he made it look really, really easy to get these out. Oh! <laughs> a bit nervous then. Right, okay. So we can now turn it over. Hi right, guys, please remember I have never even looked inside one of these movements before, let alone filming anything. So I might be fumbling around a little bit in the dark. I'm also extremely nervous about it and uh, please forgive that. Um, yeah, so now... The, the videos and the instructions basically tell me to wash everything in an ultrasonic with the whole train of wheels complete inside. And whilst I think that is probably a good idea, um, I don't think it's a good idea for this because of those jewels being so dirty. Well, everything being so dirty, really. I'd prefer, much prefer it to put through the cleaning machine Plus, I want to inspect that index wheel and uh, look at the teeth on it. So I need to 
remove the bridge, and I'm guessing I need to remove the pole assembly too. Okay, can't quite figure out how to get that off at the moment, so I'm just going to risk it, and I don't know if it's supposed to come off actually. Undo these three screws, take the train bridge off, and get access to the wheels. And the problem we've got here is a couple of the wheels have come with me. And that's going to take a little bit of working out which wheel goes where as a result of that. But it also proves or shows just how dirty this movement must be that the wheels are staying in their pivots. So I will be online looking for a photo um, for the wheel positions. Uh, it won't even come out just by tweezing, I have to hold it. Wow, that one. That one was an audible removal. <laughs> so this is the index wheel. That's the, uh, the one I've got to be particularly careful with. And they are so fragile that all you can do is hold them by the uh, pivots. And then lastly is this assembly here. One screw by lots of it. So how does this bit come apart? It's almost wedged in as well. And I don't want to damage anything, do I? So, Well, look, that is a stripped movement. We've got a lot of cleaning to do, and I've got to figure out how to get that off. It might come off after the first wash. I'm going to ultrasonic most of the parts first in a pre-wash and then it's going in the cleaning machine we'll assess the parts and then possibly clean them again well you can see now it's definitely 100 percent stripped down that just took a little bit of persuasion and this there was another screw which you would have all seen for some bizarre unknown reason i didn't i had to ask a friend <laughs> i feel quite embarrassed that i didn't see it uh, it tells you a lot about my uh, eyesight at the end of the day. Uh, but I'm relieved it's all out because this is going to need an immense amount of cleaning to get it right. And um, leaving any really sensitive parts inside is not such a good idea. While we're on the subject of cleaning, quickly bring in and focus this. This is the case back. And you can also see... Just trying to make it a bit brighter. You can also see that that is in need, big need, of a good clean too. Right, wish me luck. See you on the other side. Here is the index wheel on the digital microscope. And this one I don't think is powerful enough. I've got another one. And I think I can get a little bit closer in on the other one to actually look at the teeth in a little more detail. So I'm going to set that up and just see, because these wheels are horrifically expensive. I've actually got a spare one that I bought. It's new old stock and it cost me over £50 to buy it. Uh, so I'm hoping I don't have to use it, to be honest with you. But if I do, great. Uh, at least I've got myself out of trouble. Well, here we are on the other microscope, a lot more sensitive and a lot closer, as you can see. And now we're looking at these amazing teeth. When you think about this wheel is one thousandth of an inch thick, and it's got 360 teeth cut into it. And what we're looking for is to see that they're all there for a start. I mean, look, there's a hair of some sort that's just drifted in. 
And I found when I've inspected these before that it's, it's just slightly out of focus on this end because it's on an angle. Sometimes it's quite deceptive. I haven't washed the wheel. As you can probably tell, it's full of all that rust and debris from the movement. But on this one little inspection so far, to be honest, they look all right. I'm just going to move it. Right, and you can see here, just trying to look at them from the side profiles. A bit of big blob of white stuff there in the middle. And it's so difficult to do on this microscope to actually see what I'm doing. And what I'm trying to do is rotate the wheel around to inspect them all. So I'll do all that off camera. And although what is that red mark there? Can I have any chance of giving that a nudge? <laughs> I don't know where it's gone now. But yeah, you can see what I'm looking at and what I'm trying to get to is to inspect all of those teeth. Uh, washing wise, it's not going to go in the cleaning machine. It's a bit too risky. It'll go in some either watch cleaning fluids and then some rinse fluids in the ultrasonic. I'll probably start it first on a on a type of solvent called Renata, an English thing. It's a hairspring degreaser, really. Um, they're just so fragile, so expensive, so small. It's got everything against it. And um, if I can still use this wheel, then that's triumphant. And now it's time for the hard part, which is, of course, putting it all back together and hoping and praying that it's going to work. So I've cleaned everything up. This is actually, um, well, under the plating. So it's a bit of brass. So clearly the moisture or the uh, battery, whatever's got on that, has caused a problem. So here we go. The main part of this watch is the train. So it's all the little wheels have all got to go back in. The manual only has one small page on oiling the movement. And it doesn't seem to suggest that this particular wheel, its pivots, or the, the jewels, should I say, get oiled, which I find a bit odd. But... Um, it is a little bit ambiguous. I've printed it off and it's not all that clear either. Um, I don't think I've got the best copy. So this little part here was quite difficult to get off. Well, um, again, this is where I think it should be oiled, but I can always come back off video when you guys all light up the comments and tell me what I've done wrong and redo it. So it's a tricky little train setup on this. And some of it will have to be carried out on the main microscope because I can't really see the pivots. It's almost a small wheels as what's on a quartz watch. doesn't make for good video, um, unfortunately, but there we go. So the next thing wheel to drop in is the index. So we're going to try it with the original. And remember, folks, that wheel is, I think, 2.3, 2.4 millimetres in diameter. That is what we're dealing with. You know, here, here's my finger. It covers a whole lot. So, like this hobby, 
you got to work on some real small stuff. The last one will fit. into that jewel there. So I have to line those up a little bit better and I've got to put the train wheel bridge on it and I'm expecting that to be a real shuffle and I'm going to have to do that on my stereoscope rather than the digital microscope and the camera that you're seeing through. Um, I will need to oil the pivots on the train bridge so I'll do that now so you can see that um, but installing the train bridge I'm Going to pass putting that on camera. Do this, going to use an auto oiler. Makes the job easy. They've cleaned up absolutely lovely. And cleaning on this watch did take three cycles to be sure in the watch cleaning machine. Well, there we go. Train is all in place. And I'm really sorry I didn't show you that. It was a bit of a faff, but not uh, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, that's all. Um, the actual bridge, once I got the wheels in position, just went on literally straight away to the nudge one wheel. That was all. However, there is a slight confession, and that is I've had to break into the genuine new index wheel it was great it has this open slowly love that little canister and in the top there was the wheel and the reason for that you may ask is uh, while i was on my stereoscope i spotted rust so i'm going to show it you now i'll try to show it you now and if you look there between the leaves of the wheel and actually the top of the pivot, uh, there's a lot of rust. And, you know, ironically, the wheel might work, but I think these movements are really, really sensitive. And any type of drag is going to slow it down. So it's really, really unfortunate. I think if I buy another one of these and it's broken or the index wheel is ruined, then maybe I will chant my arm polish the pivot up and have a go but how fortunate was i to be able to have a new old stock wheel i mean these things are you know unicorn poo type stuff That certainly is one of the smallest screws I think I've ever had to deal with. Just going to put a touch of D5 on the wall of this hole. This is the uh, cam screw, Paul Lever cam screw, and I lost it. I have to confess, don't know what I did with it, uh, but fortunately it turns out it's got the same part number as the Bullover 
two on eight movement of which I have plenty of parts for so I've saved my own bacon which is a bit of a relief. There we are, slid over the cam, two screws, that's that one done. I think that's most of the tricky parts done, to be honest. So I'm just going to put this on my stereoscope just to back off the uh, pull from the wheel just in case it's touching, and then we'll continue onwards. It's looking good so far though, I'm getting quite excited. Okay, the Chaton's back in. I just need to double check that the pivot's uh, in the jewel. It looks like it is. Um, and if we're good, I can just tighten those up. Have got some rust in that screw. Need to take care of that. Um, but we'll then oil the pivots. Mobius 901. Oh, for the pivots, you can just see here. And there's the shock jewels, which uh, took a lot of cleaning, but I didn't have to undo those springs as a result. These were the cap jewels we did earlier. It looks like it's just slightly out of position to me, so I'll have to give that a nudge over. This is where the cannon pinion is going to sit. So I'll put some. D5 thicker oil on the side there for that. So that's the coils, I think. This one seems to be sitting a bit proud. There we go, it's just dropped in. So that's good, I think. Right, so a few screws. Time for the titanium tweezers. Magnetism all over the place with them coils. All right, now I've got to put that clamp in to hold the wires and you've got to be careful it doesn't crimp them. It's starting to look like a, an Accutrot again, isn't it now? That unmistakable look. Now screw down the fork.
Just going to put a little bit of oil in here. For that wheel there. And for the minute wheel here. I've already put a bit of oil on the post. There we are, they're all meshed. Tiny bit of oil for the hour wheel. And then I've just realized that screw needs to come out. As we have this hacking lever. Which isn't the easiest of things to position. Strange. So I have a little hook on the end of it there. That must go underneath something. I think I'm going to have to have a look back through the video because that might not be coming through clear on camera. It just doesn't sit right at all. It sits too high. Pretty sure it wasn't like that at all. Okay, well, we'll find out in just a moment. Well, it just went back in, actually. I just put that screen a little bit and it seemed to click it to position. Hopefully it's right. I think all it does is it's a hacking lever. And it will touch the tuning fork. So it will stop the tuning fork vibrating, which obviously causes a hack. So as far as I'm aware, it's in the right position. I don't think I have a way to test it um, until um, I've got it cased, I think, to be honest. But there you go. That is, well, I'm chuffed. It's gone back together really easily. And uh, it ain't that difficult, really. Uh, not compared to some of the things I've videoed on here. Uh, but like all Accutron, something with the 214s that I've done, it is all about the setup. The actual building of them isn't too challenging, but getting them to work, getting them to run accurately um, is a whole nother world of fun. So stick the hands on, I guess, and um, yeah, crack on. Okay, what you're looking at here is the 214 in the Accutron uh, testing set and basically you put a battery down the bottom here and we put amps into the movement and it runs and we need to be in the scale here there's the 214 max so it's on the bottom at the moment so to all intents and purposes it is running and i'm really chuffed however all is not as it would seem we are a lot of hours later this thing was not running at all, and uh, I've had to mess around with something, and it wouldn't work at all. And I'm going to show you now on the microscope um, why this is working, and why it's not acceptable, and why I've also got to try and fix it a little bit better, should we say. So, I'll set off the microscope. I think you're going to find this quite funny. Okay, so here we are on the microscope, and you can see the wheels are turning. It may stop and start because it does a little bit of that. And you can't really see it here, but you have the 
index finger and because it's vibrating and vibrating the jaw that's why you can't really see it and this is called the Paul. So it's, if you're familiar with normal watches this is basically just like your pallet fork. It's, it's grabbing a tooth, releasing a tooth and that's kind of how it does but all within a blink of an eye. And the jewels have to be absolutely square on and perfectly aligned to the teeth on the wheel or else they don't catch right and it runs a bit funny. And all this watch has been doing is humming and not running. And you can move, as I demonstrated before, the the paw, which is this screw here. It's really difficult for me to do. I've got the microscope too, too close, really. So you can now hopefully see that little small wire move a little bit. Perhaps you can't. There we go. See, see it move. And just down here, I'm blocking it with the light. See if I can get some more light onto it. The jewel moves across the teeth. That's not very good, is it? There we go. Try that. And there's a sweet spot, basically, where it's going to run and run well. But it didn't do it. And that is because that that finger there is not as straight as it might seem and there's something that a lot of you guys if you've worked on one of these might be screaming at the camera now going what are you doing why is the guard in that position we have this guard here and the guard is holding it all together the guard is loose at the moment right and it shouldn't be that far over it should be the screws come too loose now it should be around there and when we moved it off it was over here so I've been playing around, trying to get it to work and everything else. And then I went to try and tighten this up. And then it touches the finger ever so slightly. And as you can see, it tries to make it run. So what we've got essentially is a finger that is not straight, not square enough on to the wheel itself. I'm going to get a bit closer with a shot. So I'm now going to have to move the guard out of the way and try and manipulate that jewel and that finger. Now, I'm not going to do that on camera because it's just going to be fingers and it's a very tense job. This thing is less than half the thickness of a human hair, probably even thinner than that. So that's what I've got to deal with. So I'm going to get close up just so you can just see uh, what I'm dealing with. OK, so there are the two jewels in question so it does look nice and straight doesn't it that wire that that finger you can see there this is an oiler so look at the difference between the oiler and that but i'm just gonna have to angle that i think just slightly that way because when it's pushing on it it's obviously trying to push it the opposite way i think so here goes nothing let's um try and adjust it so a bit further on now i've adjusted the fingers and finally got it somewhere near i've had to fit this thing called a hacking pin because obviously this movement hacks and if i push that in i'll be a bit careful here because i'm at arm's length you hopefully can now passively read that scale oops i've just unpressed it and we're at the max 214 which in theory means this thing is kind of phase right still got regulation to do but that takes days to do but i just thought i'd show you that um and now we'll just show you a quick shot of the fingers themselves and their position and you can see there the index and the pull levers a little bit straighter i feel this great big thing here is the hacking pin and i'm just going to push it back in again and you can see it run there we are and i can't tell you how Happy I am to see that run. Trust me, it is fantastic. Hopefully this will be regulated very shortly and I'll be able to enjoy the fruits of my labour. And here it is, the finished watch on my wrist. And I could not be happier. Just look at that. It is a piece of art, a piece of horological history as well. It looks like a really decent size, yet it actually uh, measures 35.5 millimetres in diameter and it's about 30 millimetres thick as well um, but yeah it hasn't 
all been complete plain sailing and unfortunately you look at it now and it looks absolutely beautiful or i think it looks beautiful but it's actually got a different crystal on it and that wasn't intentional i have to say to remove the old crystal i wanted to remove the old crystal to get the the um the minute track out to give it a clean and um <laughs> the crystal broke didn't it so a bit of research. There's a seller in Australia. There's a seller in America. It sells reproduction ones. I went for the guy in America. It turned up. And it was a hell of a game to fit that crystal as well. It fought me all the way. It's a tension ring crystal. Haven't been able to use the tension crystal, uh, tension ring. And I had to file a little bit off as well to get it to fit in the end. So, oh, just dramatic. But, yeah, end result absolutely fantastic. I hope you have found this video um, as exciting as I have, I mean, making one of my all-time great watches uh, has been so enjoyable. I now want to go and buy more and master this movement because I don't think it's particularly difficult at all. It's just the setting up that is the is the difficult, harder part. And it's still fighting me now. We're a week on from when it's been built. I've wore it all week. And today, of all days, it's now decided to run fast. So I've got to take it apart again but i'm tempted to take it apart and service the whole thing um because i've just spent so much time on it plus the cameras dust gets in i want to do a proper job so look thank you very much for watching hope you enjoy this and uh leave comments below i'll read everyone try to answer as many as i can give the video a like if you've enjoyed it please that's all i ever ask it really really does help so hit the like button and if you're new and you enjoyed this consider subscribing. If you want to see more tuning fork videos, then click one of these that's on the screen now and uh, you can carry on your enjoyment of my channel. Thanks for being with me for fixing this Accutron and I'll see you very soon in a new video. Bye for now.